around nine o'clock. We are now called to order the second day of our synod. Thirty-five. Blessed be the Lord our God, by whose grace we are yet alive. Blessed be His Son Jesus Christ, by whose rising we are set free. Blessed be the Spirit of God, in whom we are home and our joy. Father, we come together in the name of Your Son Jesus Christ, our Redeemer to offer you our worship, praise, and thanksgiving. To you belong all power and glory. You are the source of all goodness. Let our worship bear witness to your peace and saving power. Through your spirit, may we ever rejoice in the abiding presence of our risen and ascended Lord. Amen. The Jubilate on page 37. O oh, shout to the Lord in triumph all the earth, serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his face with songs of joy. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Come into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his holy name. For the Lord is good. His loving mercy is forever. His faithfulness throughout all generations. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning. Amen. We continue on page 38. 
Lord, we pray to you for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Pointed Psalms. The Lord be with you. The appointed Psalms for today are Psalms 120 to 123. Um, 120 can be found on page 640. When I was in trouble, I called to the Lord. I called to the Lord and he answered me. What shall be done to you and what more besides? O oh, you deceitful tongue, How hateful it is that I must lodge in Meshach and dwell among the tents of Kida. I am on the side of peace, but when I speak of it, they are for war. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Behold, he who keeps watch over Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. So that the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall watch over you, your going out and your coming in, from this time forth forevermore. Now our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city, but that is a unity with itself. To which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, the assembly of Israel, to praise the name of the Lord. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Sorry, yes. <laughs> May they prosper who love you. For my brethren and companions' sake, I pray for your prosperity. To you I lift up my eyes, to you enthroned in the heavens. And the right of servants look to the hand of their masters. And the right of the maid to the hand of the mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God. 
until he show us his mercy. Too much of the scorn of the indolent rich and of the derision of the proud. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. A reading from Second Kings chapter 22, verses 1 to 13. Second Kings 22, 1 to 13. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother's name was Judah, Judiah, daughter of Adiah. She was from Boskar. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. In the 18th year of his reign, King Josiah sent the secretary, Serap, son of Azar, the son of Mesulam, to the temple of the Lord. He said, go up to Hilkar, the high priest, and have him get ready the money that has been brought into the temple of the Lord which the doorkeepers have collected from the people. Have them entrust it to men appointed to supervise the work on the temple. And have these men pay the workers who repair the temple of the Lord, the carpenters, the builders, and the masons. Also have them purchase timber and dress stone to repair the temple but they need not account for the money entrusted to them because they are acting faithfully. Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Sharpen, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Sharpen, who read it. Then Sharpen, the secretary, went to the king and reported to him. Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors of the temple. Then Sharfan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkar, the priest, has given me a book. And Sharfan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. He gave these orders to Hilkar, the priest, Anikam, son of Shephan, Abkor, son of Micah, Sarphan, the secretary, and Azar, the king's attendant. Go inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written concerning us. Haika the priest, Aikam, Akpa, Seraphim, and Azar went to speak on the prophetess Holder, who was the wife of Shechem, the son of Peva. This is the word of the Lord. We now say the Benedictus on page 40.
You have come to your people and set them free. You have raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of your servant David. Through your holy prophets, you promised of old to save us from our enemies. Hands of all that to show mercy to our forebears, and to remember your holy covenant. This was the oath you swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship you without fear, holy and righteous before you all the days of your life. A new child shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for the Lord to prepare the way, to give God's people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine upon those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father. Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it's now and ever shall be, all without end. The second reading is taken from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 11, reading verse 2, then 17 to 22. First Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 2, and 17 to 22. I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions just as I handed them unto you. Now in the following instructions, I do not commend you because you come together. It is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper, for when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and the other becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. The word of the Lord. Now stand and reaffirm our faith by saying together the Apostles' Creed. Believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered on the Pontius Pilate died and was buried. He descended. On the third day he rose again, ascended into heaven, and is at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of sins, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Suffrages be on page Show us mercy, O Lord. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. And under your care. Let your way be known upon earth. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Create in us clean hearts, O God. Proper 22 on page 179. The Lord be with you. Together we pray. Almighty and everlasting God. You are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask. Through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Page 45. Together into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves this day. Let your presence be with us to its close. Strengthen us to remember that in whatever good work we do, we are serving you. Give us a diligent and watchful spirit that we may seek in everything to know your will and knowing it may gladly perform it to the honor and glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the rest of the past night and for the gift of a new day with its opportunities of pleasing you. Grant that we may so pass its hours in the perfect freedom of your service, that at evening we may again give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Page 79. And we'll sit together, prayer number 15. Almighty and ever-living God, source of all wisdom and understanding, be present with those who take counsel in our synod for the renewal and mission of your church. Teach us in all things to seek first your honor and glory. Guide us to perceive what is right and grant us both the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Page 82, number 25. Heavenly Father, whose Son Jesus Christ, born of a woman, sanctified childhood and shared the life of an earthly home, bless the homes and families of our nation. Give to parents a true sense of responsibility in the care and the training of their children, that our boys and girls may grow up in the fear of your name and the fellowship of your church. For the glory of Christ our Lord. Amen. 
page 83, number 28. God, our Father, we pray for our young people growing up in an unstable and confusing world. Show them that your ways give more meaning to life than the ways of the world, and that following you is better than chasing after selfish goals. Help them to take failure, not as a measure of their worth, but as a chance for a new start. Give them strength to hold their faith in you and to keep alive their joy in your creation. Page 47, the prayer of dedication. Together, Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light to our paths, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all persons in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Now to him who is able to do immeasurable more than all we can ask or conceive, by the power which is at work among us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all ages. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us bless the Lord. And Thanks be to God. God. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Words are from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. Paul the Apostle uses a certified agree to pose this question to the church in Corinth. It is a form that he uses quite frequently. We see it again in his letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 6. The same do you not know. Do not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? It is the kind of question that in particular has one answer. It's the kind of question that is posed when the questioner knows the answer, as it were, to the question. And so the rhetorical devices used by Paul is intended to convince his readers to accept this message, the message of the importance of knowing God, knowing God, and that that knowledge would be self-implicating. That knowledge would lead to transformation. Transformation is a goal of Christian spirituality. Hence, the frequent celebration of the Holy Eucharist, the daily recitation of the daily office, morning prayer and evening prayer. These are not ends in themselves, but they lead to something else. These all form part of a spirituality that is considered to be visible, tangible, leads to change into the likeness of Christ. Both Sandra Schneiders and Philip Sheldrick, writers in the area of Christian spirituality, among others, that the word spirituality has become increasingly popular these days, well beyond their, its Christian origin and indeed beyond religion itself. Sheldrick says that there seems to be a widely held view that there is a spirit-filled side to life, and this has fueled this kind of quest. It has been noted that part of the phenomena of the term spirituality is that it appears increasingly in a range of disciplines or across a range of disciplines in the professional world of healthcare and social work, education, the art, the studies. Schneider states that spirituality has become 
popular among athletes, entertainers, and business people. I've often been invited to give talks on spirituality at industrial and commercial places for one reason or another. Sheldrick himself argues that spirituality is a term that is used by many until it is time to define exactly what it is. Widespread use of the word spirituality is it difficult to offer a simple definition. However, a it stands for lifestyles and practices that encourage an aspirational approach to life. Indeed, contemporary spirituality reflects the sense that a truly fulfilled life involves more than purely material success or intellectual satisfaction. There's agreement that without question, over the last decade or two, the concept of spirituality has reached well beyond its origins in Christianity. It has come to inhabit a variety of social and professional contexts. As a result, what is understood currently by spirituality tends to take on certain priorities in the cultures within which it finds itself. Contemporary spirituality has become a changing thing. And notice that I said thing. It is something that changes color depending on the physical or philosophical environment. An arguably subjective turn in Western culture has created diverse and individual approaches to spiritual experience or spiritual practice. It seems clear that the interest in spirituality has become part of a broader process of social and cultural change. We live in a society that pays particular attention to the needs of the self, the needs of the self. This, however, has never been the outlook of Christian spirituality. And so we need to explore, and as one person said, unpack the notion of self. Professor Kevin Urban always makes the point that if we get our personal pronouns right, that we will get our theology right. When we read, for example, the prayer texts in the Book of Common Prayer, we realize that they all use plural, personal pronouns. Almighty God, grant us. We say, let us pray. Grant Almighty God that we, the all plural, personal pronouns. And this is consistent with Christian prayer, which developed out of our Jewish heritage. Jewish faith is a community faith and that centers on family and community. Christian spirituality has always centered on community. When the Spirit came on the Feast of Pentecost, he did not simply rest on one individual, Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. He did not simply rest on one individual. He did not simply rest on a trio of persons, the, what seemed to be in the inner circle. The Holy Spirit did not simply rest on Peter and James and John. But the Holy Spirit came to rest on everyone that was within the room. The Holy Spirit touched everyone, a body of persons. They could all testify that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. If the same was to occur this morning, at this very moment, while the Spirit is indeed here with us, if the Spirit was to come in a kind of dramatic form as expressed by the author of the Acts of the Apostles, he would not simply rest on a few of us. 
but he would, the Spirit would rest on all of us, both the house of laity and the house of clergy and naturally the house of bishops. So when we think of the notion of self, this, the term itself is ambiguous. It can suggest the individualistic, egotistic for one's craving or desire. It can also mean something more deeply vested in the presence of God that is unselfish. Thomas Merton's quest for the self, for example, involve a growing conviction in the face of a prevailing individualistic culture that people exist truly in community and in solidarity with others. Both Life and Holiness, published in 1964, Thomas Merton says that Christian holiness in our age means more than the awareness of our common responsibility to cooperate with the mysterious designs of God for the human race. It has been recognized that a major part of the problem has been the historical tendency to adopt a sort of unbalanced rhetoric of interiority. Interiority is another fascinating Christian term. But we must not misunderstand interiority. We must not misunderstand what is implied in the journey inward. For indeed, Jesus will say to us that the kingdom of God is within you. But this implies selfish, individualistic spirituality. Self identified with the notion that I do not care who you are about. I do my relationship with God and God alone. Spirituality but educating must lead to transformation not only of the self but of society. Any attempt at transformation must begin with an authentic relationship with God. So we may put this another way. While transformation must begin with the self, there's no denying this. We must never think, we must never think that I am simply okay. There's a fascinating book I read many years ago. It says, you're okay, I'm okay. It's a book on psychology. Under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit, transformation must move from within us to encourage all that is good and wholesome in society. This means taking a new look at the foundations of our society. We must begin by looking at the theological implications of our foundational roots. This leads to some of the paradoxes that we talked about yesterday. For Sheltie, the traditional and familiar societal identities and religious and other institutional social settings have been substantially deconstructed. In other words, the very elements, the building blocks of our society have all come to seem to have come to mean something different to so many different persons. Traditional institutions are no longer assumed to be capable of providing effective channels for the contemporary spiritual quest. For increasing numbers of people, this means that they find it necessary to seek new sources of self-orientation and value. We are faced with a new reality, almost what persons call a new normal in our contemporary society. And we must be watchful about this. There are those who will speak, for example, of being spiritual, but not, but not religious. And so spirituality today has become kind of a personalized and, and democratized sort of phenomena that draws from a range of sources. 
that draws from a range or variety of faiths, and sometimes no faith at all. Sandra Schneider shares the view with Philip Sheldry that spirituality is regularly distinguished and contrasted with religion. Many people who no longer identify with institutional religion or even religious belief, as mentioned, describe themselves as spiritual, as they seek to espouse practices that do not form the framework of any particular religion. There's even the oxymoron of a sort of atheistic spirituality. The stats for most, Christ for most Caribbean countries reveal that the number of those claiming no religion, that number seems to be getting higher. It seems to be moving away from our religious roots. There was a time when to be a Caribbean person was the same thing as being a religious person. They went hand in hand. We will see God Almighty in everything. We will see God Almighty in the birth of a child, the marriage of, of two persons in, in love with each other. We will see God in riding on the winds of a hurricane, whatever it is. We, saw. we will see God in the midst of it all. Spirituality relates to our quest for meaning including the goal and purpose of life. Because of its association with meaning and life direction, spirituality also relates to understandings of identity, the development of personality, self, and transformation. There's yet another challenge when we speak of spirituality and self and transformation. For because of the differences and varieties and strains of spirituality, there are those who see spirituality as only comforting and consoling. In other words, we must come to realize that spirituality helps to deal with the tough and the rough and exists in the difficult choices and the challenging times in which we live. I've encountered persons whose faith has been shattered in the light of challenging circumstances of life. But of course, we must be able to connect our understanding of spirituality in the context of suffering, both mental and physical, the context of, of illness, and old age and the process of dying. Our spirituality must also be connected in the context of failed programs because not everything will work. Not everything will work. Not every process will work. Not every bright idea will work. Even as church, we will get it wrong at times. We may get it wrong at times. Not everything will go as planned. Not everything will prosper and increase. In the Caribbean and the rest of the world, then, we have to truly examine what it means for us to be, to be spiritual, what spirituality means, and how this leads to transformation. One of the things we can say for sure is that spirituality must be communitarian. Sheldrake is of the view that how we approach the relationship between the Christian life and social engagement depends on the theological value that we hold. There's one writer who holds the view that a contemplative life must always lead to the notion of a common life for all. So inwardness, inwardness is never self-centeredness. A number of recent writers in Christian spirituality suggest that the church's mystical and liturgical way is closely related to the public world, to politics, commerce, and industry. We are not engaged in doing our own thing behind closed doors. It will mean nothing if the deep councils that take place within this synod do not find their way in the marketplace 
in order that ordinary people can be engaged in God talk as well. That ordinary people can be engaged in talk about the church and theological things over the next three years at least. The Anglican Church, as has been said, is like a large secret. So much of what we do is not known. The Anglican Church can only transform if we engage. People can only hear if we speak. They can only see if we show. They can only walk towards Jesus if we point in the right direction. Transformation is the activity of the Holy Spirit through us. Not simply the ordained members of the church, but the entire body of Christian believers. We are the leaven that causes the bread to rise. The liberation theologies of the last century were primarily concerned about this kind of social engagement. They start understanding that we, we draw from the world and then we take out into the world something that is awesome, beautiful, and transformative. That we bring the world into the liturgy, in our colleagues and the prayers of the people, the intercessory prayer, in order that from within the context of our liturgical prayer, we may continue that process of changing the world, transforming the world into the likeness of God. Ron Williams, former Archbishop of Canterbury, and one of the most original theologians of present time, makes a related point in his essay, Sacrament of the New Society, where he argues that solidarity in God is expressed by and facilitated by the sacramental order, especially baptism, and the Eucharist. What he states is that what is needed is perhaps re-inspiration. I find that an interesting term, re-inspiration. We live in a world that is described by the author of the book of Genesis as good. It is a world that is graced by God. It is a world in which, into which Christ comes. God Almighty becomes human in order that we as humans may become holy. This world with all of its flaws, with all of its challenges, and with all of its problems is yet the stage of the Holy Spirit. Is yet the stage for the enactment of liturgy and sacrament, Christian spirituality by which we change the world. God Almighty is the one whose Holy Spirit is with us that Holy Spirit given to us freely in order that we may transform our societal structures. He gives us the means by which this process of transformation can be sustained. Let us pray. Almighty God, for as much as without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.